Hi, welcome Hi. back to the Richard and Judy Book Club, exclusively at WH Smith. And uh, our next novel uh, is actually, a, it's probably my favourite. Ah, it's you see, I said you'd said you have a favourite. It's certainly one of, my, <laughs> one of my very top reads. It is absolutely fantastic. It's called The Wilding. It's written by Maria McCann. It's a historical novel. And it's actually set in 1672, which is uh, a generation or so after the very bloody English Civil War. Um, and Maria, everything is kind of sort of getting back to normal, isn't it? Mm, and right. what I love about it, one of the many things I love about it, is it's set in this lovely rural, idyllic, um, pastoral setting, isn't it? And it starts off as being so, it's unbelievably beautiful. I mean, I love the hero, Jonathan. I love him. He's 21, isn't he? Um, well, he's, he's 26, actually, 26, when it starts, right. yes. OK. And, uh, but still a, a young man, a very, a very young yes. man. Yes, um, young in lots of ways. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and mm. the only child of parents who absolutely adore mm. him. And he, th th they have, for the time, they have, they're, they're quite successful and, and quite prosperous, aren't yes. they? Yes. Yeah. And this, I, I, I'll get to the business of making <laughs> cider. In, 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 in I it. told you she liked it. No, I'm sorry. I'm a bit, uh, She'll I, tell you your story in a minute. Whenever, whenever I get really enthusiastic about a book, I get slightly incoherent, so you'll have to forgive me. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, he, he, is, he is a cider maker. And that is the origin of the title, The Wilding, because tell us what The Wilding actually mm. is. Um, well, he defines a wilding as what he calls a bastard apple tree. Uh, it's a tree that springs up out of nowhere but is later adopted to become a cider apple tree, and, and there yeah. are instances of, of trees like that yeah. that have become part of English cider stock. Right. Yeah. And he goes around, he makes his living, basically, by going around when the apples are falling and, and pressing them into cider. He's, he's a brilliant cider maker. It sounds really odd to us, but he, I mean, he's got a fantastic press designed by his father. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, and then something happens. His, his father gets... Uh, a letter from uh, his father's brother, Jonathan's uncle, saying that he's dying. And so the father goes off to see him. And after that, everything becomes strange and shady mm. and, and difficult. It, it does become very, um, what's the word, gritty. I mean, it, it's quite sort of, a lot of the, the, the kind of love in it is kind of quite forbidden and intense and slightly depraved. And, yeah, and you're really good at that, aren't you? I mean, you really, <laughs> did, did you do loads and loads of research? <laughs> Into being depraved. Being depraved, yeah. <laughs> yes. you know, being depraved in the 17th century. So I mean, going out for the week, darling, to research <laughs> depravity. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, well, I, I think I, I do tend to write, yes, about love relationships that are difficult, conflicted, um, yeah edgy, uncomfortable. There, there is a resolution of kinds at the end of the novel. Oh, as yes, you know, definitely. There's an atmosphere of, of, to some degree, of reconciliation. But yes, he starts off thinking that he's in a pastoral. And I was really pleased mm. that you used that word. Yeah. Um, and I, I had been writing the novel quite a while. Uh, I think I'd almost finished it, in fact, before I realised that this was a man who lives, thinks he lives in a pastoral, but actually he's living in, in some ways in a gothic. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and which, which he doesn't know. He no. has no idea of. No, that's yeah. right. Yeah. What struck me, uh, Judy read the book first and was going wild about it. Um, what struck me almost straight away was the sense of period that you managed to evoke. I mean, this is a very specific point in, in English mm. history. You know, as you say, it's a generation after after Cromwell, um, and yes, the the, the, the the terrors, the horrors of the Civil War are beginning to fade, mm. um, and you and you capture that very very well and quite sparsely actually in, in the way you write. But but the detail of what daily life was like for people back then, it's almost like looking at a photograph. It's you you said this. It's almost like being in a dream. It's as if you're dreaming that you're in post Cromwellian times. How on earth did you get that level of of veracity? I mean, it really comes across as uh, off the page as we are really back there, four hundred odd years ago. How did you get that? Um, well, of course, it's never really real. It's what you can get the reader to accept. Yes. Well, you congratulations, because I bought it online in the second. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I had done a lot of research into everyday life um, when I wrote um, a previous novel, As Meat Loves Sold, and that one had to be very detailed about dates as well, yeah. because it was in the middle of the which, war. Which got very, very good reviews, didn't mm. it? It um, did, yeah. yes. Fantastic it um, And this one isn't connected with it, but it's a generation later. Yeah. Um, so I already had a lot of that stuff already in my head, yeah. a lot of stuff about the kinds of things that people would be likely to eat, but, uh, and, and things like that. But actually, it wasn't necessary to be quite so detailed, and you said I did it sparsely. Mm. Um, it's a small domestic canvas yes and therefore um, in a way not so not so difficult um, yeah. to write about what people might have said or but done as on a really big one but yeah. what you what you've done is you you've this is a, a a timeless truism but what you've done is you've made us appreciate that people have always been the same 
whether it was frankly the Romans or the Egyptians or the Cromwellians mm. or the post we're all the same, aren't we? And, mm. and the way we react to each other, whatever the circumstances might be that warp and bend and twist us, mm. effectively, we haven't changed a bit in, in millennium, mm. have we? Mm. I, I think the thing that really, um, yes, that I think never changes is that people have to learn about themselves and it's always difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we always have a fake idea of ourselves, quite often inflated. Sometimes we think too little of ourselves, but usually it's the other yeah. way around and he's always learning. His well, let's, let, let, let's go a little mm. bit further into the sort of the dark side of the book. What happens is that he becomes so obsessed with finding out what was in this note that his dying uncle sent his brother, mm. because obviously his father has been very disturbed by this. So he goes off on one of his apple making mm. trips and decides to go and visit his aunt, his widowed aunt, um, um, and while he's there, who's absolutely horrible, by the way, <laughs> his widowed aunt, <laughs> marvellously drawn character, absolutely vile, but um, she's quite rich, and she has a servant girl called Tamar, and now Tamar is the key, really, to the mm. whole story, mm. and to the whole unravelling of Jonathan's innocence and happiness, and in fact, the life that she and her mother lived um, as young um, as, as, as sort of a, 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 well, she wasn't even that old, really, um, mm. woman and her, her sort of illegitimate daughter having to live in a cave, you know, mm. in woods uh, with Squ no fuel. Squalor is mm. a poor Squal one. Yeah. Oh, I like squalor. Yes, I do. You revel in squalor. You really? <laughs> squalor, depravity, <laughs> tick your For, box. Forced yes. to work as prostitutes and everything just to, just to get basic food and basic fuel mm. and everything. And is that historically uh, accurate? I mean, were women of uh, that class, of that type, forced into, pro into occasional prostitution and, uh, to make ends meet? Oh, I think until quite recent times, yeah. women drifted in and out of prostitution at the bottom of the social scale, yes. Right. They yeah. might not necessarily necessarily define themselves as, as prostitutes, prostitutes, but sometimes yeah. it happened. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I imagine that a cave would be one of the best places that you could live, at least it would be watertight and yep. um, you know, reasonably safe. Yeah. Um, it makes you wonder how, how people could possibly survive. The language is very accessible, I mean just because you're writing about 1672 doesn't mean that you've written all the language in oh some no, weird no, no. kind of ancient dialogue. Mm. It's, it's very, it, 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 it reads like it could mm. be today, except of course it's not, it's completely rooted mm. in the past. That's what I meant about, about it connecting us with, our, with, mm. with the timelessness of the human condition. You know? Why did you, because as Meat Loves Salt was um, such a huge success, it was ten years ago. It why, was. Why, why has it taken so long to, to write this one? she's uh, depraved. You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think I, I'm the only, I don't think I can answer that alone because in fact I did write at the books. Right. Um, which were not accepted. But, really? But, yes, and then this one came along um, and was accepted and you know, has had very good How reviews. How depressing, because, because um, your first book got rave reviews. I know. Meat Loves Salt. <laughs> What, what, what's, uh, that's just interesting that, and anyone who's watching who, who fancies themselves mm. as a writer, what, what, what do you think happened there? Were they wrong? I think the first one was actually wrong for the time. Um, okay. um, the second one was unfortunate in that it, it, I brought it out with, uh, at the same time as a number of other people who I didn't know but had just published books on very similar that, yes. happened, that happened to that me. Happened. That happened to um, me. Uh, yeah, so it was a long story. Anyway, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was a, it was a bit of ill judgment and a bit of bad luck. Um, okay. I have been asked by more than one person, "Why do you always write as a man?" And the fact is that I don't. No, I but don't these know. are the two books that have been taken and, 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 and the, uh, it, have the, been the accepted. The protagonists are here. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, I think it's it's, it's an absolutely wonderful book, and uh, any, anybody who uh, enjoys historical novels, uh, any, anybody actually who enjoys a good story, will love it. And you um, have a, you have a wonderful command of the language you really do it's, thank you yeah yeah it's it's um, you, I, I was reading paragraphs here and then I'm thinking oh yes that's sweet that's <laughs> sweet as a somerset apple that is um <laughs> well look many congratulations and it's and it's, a, it's it's also i mean uh, we've just uh, in, uncovered this it's uh, it's a lesson of hope really for writers you know that you, you know if it, the second time you don't succeed try try and try again it is you have to persevere and you have to keep on absolutely yes, keep on. like your character in the book <laughs> thank you very thank much you. indeed thank you congratulations thank you, thank you. Well, we'd love to know what you think about The Wilding by uh, Maria McCann. Post your own review uh, and opinions online on our website. And we'd also love to hear which out of all eight of our books is your favourite. And you can check out all the information about all of those eight books on that website, which is www.whsmith.co.uk forward slash Richard and Judy. Uh, lovely to talk to you and uh, tune in for another one soon. <laughs>